Would you like to know how one Icelandic bombshell grew her online business to seven figures in just four years? Then you want to listen in to this episode of Untapped. Sigrun is one heck of a woman. She's the type of woman who turned down the role as CEO of Nissan Sweden to follow love to Switzerland. Once there, after a lot of soul searching, she figured out how to leverage 10 years of corporate CEO experience for several major companies, an MBA in entrepreneurship, and a whole lot of passion into an incredible online business mentoring woman. In no less than four years with absolute transparency, she's built her business up from five figures in year one to four years later, scaling her business to hit seven figures in revenue. She runs retreats, masterminds, and her signature program, Somba, which stands for Sigrun's Online MBA. What's more, this Icelandic powerhouse gets amazing results for her clients through her laser sharp coaching instincts, straight up advice, and genuine love for seeing women entrepreneurs succeed. I hope you enjoy this episode. By the way, it's also a video interview, and you can catch that over at youtube.com forward slash Natalie Sisson. All right, let's dive in. Sigrun, welcome to the Untapped podcast. You are officially my first guest on this podcast, and I couldn't think of anybody better to have. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Yeah, we're matchy matchy because I know how much you are all about red, and it is a power color. What is it about red for you, actually, that you love? Well, it was always my favorite color as a child, so I didn't pick it like some people pick their brand colors. It was just there already, so there was never a question which color to pick. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it does, it does mean to me now power, passion, uh, perseverance too. Mm, I love it, the three Ps. <laughs> cool. Well, as you know, Untapped is all about how to untap your potential. Where are you not living up to your fullest potential in life? Um, where are you settling? And where have you not even tried to expand on some of your capabilities to see what your actually your real potential is? And in your case, your story is so fascinating to me. I mean, everybody loves a good story, but really you've gone on quite the journey throughout your life. And I'd love for you to just share a snippet of that now, because the biggest thing for me was you've had this really great success in sort of being CEO in the corporate life. And then this, this period, which you'll talk about, which you really had to probably pull on some of your deepest strengths. And as you said, perseverance um, to get through that and come out the other side with a massively successful business. that's just growing from strength to strength. And somewhere in that is a ton of mindset, which is the bit that I really want to dig into today. So please do share a little bit about your story so people get to know more about you. So I have to start with, telling people that I'm Icelandic um, because Iceland is, well, it's getting more and more known, but I don't think everyone knows where it is and how it is to live there and how do the people look. We're quite normal people. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you're anything but normal, but that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, but I guess what I realized and I'm realizing more and more with every year is that it is unique in many ways because we're only 350,000 people and it's an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And there's a lot of things that comes with that. You know, we, we love to go away. We love to travel. We love to study in other countries, but we also love to go back because there's something around the Icelandic culture that draws us back. You know, this idea of anything is possible, uh, everything will work out. And, uh, you know, if there's fish in the sea, we just go and catch a lot of fish and then we spend the money. So uh, we've had a lot of inflation over the years, uh, which means that we're not a saving culture. We'll just give it all away <laughs> or <laughs> reinvest in the business or whatever. Like we don't have this idea of um, big savings account but we do own our own houses. That's important to us. We do not rent. That's against our mm -hmm. values. Um, but it's about like, everybody is by first name. So last names are foreign to us. And you can approach anyone. You can go up and talk to the president. And uh, that's just another normal human being. And you, there, is, there, is, there is no hierarchy, uh, pretty flat structure. Yes, we've had some 
more people getting rich, especially with the whole crash and an and, and upward turn again. Some people could benefit it and others less. Uh, but overall, a very equal society. And we are number one in gender equality the last 10 years. And I know I said, um, and, and uh, because I have been a feminist since I was 16 years old, <laughs> uh, I see so much still to be done. So it does bother me mm. that you get that title, number one, mm. when it's still so much to be done. So I say always like, we're number one. It just, it doesn't mean that we are so good. It just means that there's no one else better, which yeah. is sad. Yeah. But still room to improve, right? Yeah. I think room to improve. Been, I've probably been a feminist since I was about 16 as well, actually, but probably not knowing it quite as well as you. Another thing that I know about Iceland to be true, or at least the last time I checked, is that you have the most entrepreneurs per capita in the world. Now, I appreciate you're a smaller country, but uh, is that still true? Yeah. And we yeah. actually are uh, most people per capita in many, many categories. Mm, you have to look yeah. at it. It's a, it's a you know, um, educated society. Uh, people are uh, close knit communities. So it's in many ways, I feel often easier to get things done and reach people and network and, and kind of move ahead. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yeah, we are, we joke around this. We also have the most Miss Worlds per capita in the world. <laughs> and now it's a little bit frowned upon because we don't like uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, competitions pageants. anymore. Yeah. But yeah, pageants, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it does, it does, uh, it, it does give me certain, like when you talk about, you know, untapped potential or, or mindset, I think just coming from Iceland, coming from the society, and that's why I spent a few minutes explaining it, does explain a lot of how I've been able to do what I do today. Yeah, you're kind of unstoppable, really. I mean, it's almost <laughs> like you've really bred into the Icelandic philosophy on life and you've taken it that out into other areas as well to sort of get to where you want to be. Yeah, it doesn't mean that every Icelander is like me, but no. I think I've taken those qualities with me that are needed for entrepreneurship. Um, but, you know, when I was 20 years old, moving to Germany to study, that was the biggest thing I could do back then. So I don't think I was born an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I think this could be nice for some people to hear yeah. who don't think they were born entrepreneurs. You know, when we hear about Richard Branson and Gary Vee that they were selling when they were six year old, I'm like, oh, so I cannot be an entrepreneur. So luckily there is a place for us, other people who don't think we were born entrepreneurs. Um, and it comes with later. And actually it's better to be a little bit older too when you start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I started to study in Germany. I studied architecture and uh, basically I was studying for a long time and then I moved back to Iceland and then I uh, started to work, uh, run software companies and IT company. And suddenly being a CEO, I realized, oh, I didn't have a business education. I was basically an architect with a half finished computer science degree on the side. And <laughs> I decided I had to go for an MBA. So I quickly finished my computer science degree and went for an MBA. And, um, and there, so I did all these degrees on the side and maybe that's another threat. You know, I saw the red threats in hindsight because, you know, now I design businesses instead of houses. Uh, the computer science degrees has obviously helped me with online business. And, um, and then, yeah, the business degree I saw, actually I saw the problems with an MBA degree. I think I learned, I learned a few things, but I was constantly observing because I was a little bit older. Mm. I was one of the older generation doing an MBA. I was already a CEO and I saw what I was not getting. I was not learning on, about entrepreneurship. I was not learning about, modern types of marketing, of course, uh, you know, online business was starting and I should have learned something about that. So I think probably already back then it planted a seed in me. Like I have this feeling like I can do it better, like mm -hmm. not in an arrogant way, but like I can do it better. But then it was just an idea in the drawer and, uh, came out later when I was yeah. ready. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now let's talk about that little transition between being, um, you know, a CEO of a company, um, and doing really well, being really high level. And then what happened that kind of deterred everything on your track for you, kind of really shook your world? 
So I was in London and uh, I uh, had kind of on purpose lost my job because it wasn't my, the right job any longer. And I was looking for the next opportunity. And I was really in that world, like next job, like a bigger CEO job, more employees, more revenue. Like I didn't see anything else. And uh, I uh, walked up to a famous, world famous CEO and said, hello. Well, my name is Sigrun and he offered me a job. <laughs> uh, and so at the same time, I'm meeting my now husband. So I suddenly I had this job offer to be a CEO of Nissan in Sweden or move to Switzerland with one suitcase to be with a man I had met three, four times. <laughs> uh, and I, I took the untraditional route, uh, let's say for me, because I was still like, career, 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 and you don't do anything different for a man and no compromises. I follow my dreams, but there was something I was, you know, already 40 years old. And I thought like, if I want to have a life, you know, relationship and a family, <laughs> there's time to do something about it. So I took the Switzerland route and then the I, you chose I took the love route. <laughs> I took the love route. <laughs> and it's funny, it's Sweden and Switzerland. It's a typical two countries that the Americans always uh, mix up. You say to someone that you're from Switzerland, and two minutes later, uh, how is it in Sweden? I'm like, really? really? I don't know. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Quite different so anyway, <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, I am then in Switzerland without a job. And uh, I put on Sing and LinkedIn, like looking for a job. And one day... Somebody messaged me and there's a job offer 15 minutes away from my living. And I became a managing director of a medical device company. Okay. And it was a small business where I really didn't really have employees. I was more working on business plans and things like that. And a little bit boring compared to my CEO job in Iceland where I was constantly in the news and, you know, fun stuff and conferences and things like that. And I don't know it was that, but I also, the working conditions, I was working a lot and I had a desk that was too high and chair was too low and I developed repetitive strain injury. Mm. And uh, it started with headaches and pinching ear pain and uh, neck pain and, uh, and then there were headaches and I didn't see the pattern, but it was like Friday and then it was Thursday and Friday. And then it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Wow. And scary. Uh, yeah, it was very scary how I just, there was less and less days where I didn't have a headache. Mm. And then it just one week, it became constant. And uh, I remember this 23rd of November, 2010. Wow. So I went home and uh, for seven months I was on the sofa and uh, looking for a solution. In the beginning, I didn't want, know what it was. I figured it out by talking to a friend in America over Skype. He said, yeah, you have repetitive strain injury. It's not a acknowledged mm. uh, sickness in Switzerland mm. or even in Iceland, but in the UK and the United States. So I just read up on it on the internet and ordered some books. And then I went to my... A physiotherapist and said, this is what's wrong with me. <laughs> yeah. um, but it has a lot to do with just, you know, I, I went for daily walks for an hour. Uh, I looked after my posture and uh, it took months to get better. Like what really helped me to get, you know, I was having these massages. I was going to therapists like multiple times a week to, to get massages and nothing seemed to work until I tried kinesio tape. Mm. Uh, which doesn't really do much, but you see the athletes in the Olympics with it. Yeah. I was having that tape before that became like world famous. Um, <laughs> of course you would. And it, and it costs just $10 a roll. Wow. You can do it yourself. You know, my husband can put it on me. And then everything else started to work. Mm. Um, I but had there no was idea that RSI was um, so... I guess, restrictive in that sense. Like I knew it was for a lot of people they'd have to stop working because they couldn't even move their arms or hands, but I didn't realize that it got so restrictive in terms of how it affected you and headaches and everything. Yeah. If you leave it, you know, if you don't do something mm -hmm. about that, and that's why uh, I, haven't, I haven't really talked a lot about it. I think on my podcast, you will find one or two episodes where I talk mm -hmm. about being sick and what I, because I didn't want to, you know, it's not the reason for everything in life and not, and not in my case. And I do think if you talk so much about sickness and all these 
bad stuff that it also attracts the wrong audience in some sense. You know, I'm happy to share it and I'm not hiding it, but I haven't made it a big thing. Um, no, but what I think is so spectacular about it is the recovery that you had. And I think probably in that time, I mean, one, we're all human and there's a lot of entrepreneurs right now who are experiencing burnout at a greater rate than ever. And I've talked about this in my book, The Freedom Plan, because it bugs me, it bothers me that we all have this kind of attitude right now. You have to work, 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 and you can't take time out for yourself. Um, and it's going to start debilitating other people. So I think it's a really good thing to bring to the front. But I've also seen so many people have life-changing moments with a health scare, um, with something that has affected them that didn't allow them to live their best life for a period, and they've come out even stronger the other side. And that's the thing that I'm really fascinated in. So um, I really appreciate you sharing it, but also within that, I'm sure there was this sort of deeper strength and desire to live a really full life that came out of, you know, that seven month period. Yeah. The thing was, I, I was, I was sick. Like I couldn't sit on the computer more than 10 minutes. Like I would like wow. get this horrible pain and, and the headache would get stronger. Um, so, but at the same time, my mind was like, what can I do? And I was like, I need to use this time productively. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I couldn't just sit and uh, watch YouTube videos. I've never been that type of person. I've always kind of like, I need to do something productive. Not that I need to use, I, I waste a lot of time on Facebook and stuff. So uh, it was more around like overall, what can I do for the next weeks and months? I didn't know how long I would be sick, but I realized it would be several weeks at least. Um, so I signed up for lynda.com. And watched videos on Lightroom and Photoshop and those tools where I felt I had fallen a bit behind, you know, and didn't know the up-to-date things. And that was great. I felt I was doing something. It was not like I didn't have a business, so I didn't know what else I should be doing. Um, but it did make me think about, well, if this is, if this is the way I, I need to live, like with some kind of a sickness, like what can I do about it? And how can I make it doesn't, you know, once I get healthy, how can I make sure it doesn't happen again? Mm. Uh, and I really started to think about entrepreneurship. And actually, I think the first seed was planted 2008 when I went to Tony Robbins on Lisa's Power Within in London. I met my now husband there. And there were, the fact that there's so many entrepreneurs in the room makes me think like, why am I not an entrepreneur? Like this is a conference that attracts a lot of business owners. And I did create like a vision, not a vision board, like you make a list of things you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, like a and then I, list. yeah, like a bucket list. Like, you know, what do you want? Yeah. And I wrote down, um, well, I didn't even know what I wrote, wrote down until I, you know, I found it. I, I, I lost that sheet of paper mm -hmm. um, and I wrote down, have my own business, make a million dollars. I, I said, what? When I found the sheet <laughs> end of, and a year ago, I found it again in, in a binder somewhere. No it way. fell out and I'm like, I love it. <laughs> it's all come true. Be careful what you wish for, they say. I Be love it. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. yeah. So there was this like, uh, while I was sick, obviously I could think a lot, um, but I was a little bit scared. Like if you're sick, a starter business, like, uh, and, and I was always like, uh, I need to have this great business idea and it needs to make a lot of money. And, uh, I, you know, I, I didn't know how to start. So I was like taking the more safer route when somebody offered me a job, but I could work from home. Mm -hmm. So that did plant another seed. So I set up my office and I bought an office chair and I had like a, you know, height adjustable table and I was like, hmm, I kind of like this. Uh, so when that job uh, didn't work out, I was like, okay, this is it. And uh, it's time for Sigrun to unleash. <laughs> <laughs> I was still in that mode, like, uh, what's my business idea? What's my business idea? So I did a, like a course for startups in Switzerland uh, that they offer actually from the unemployment agency, which was awesome. And when, if you do the course and write a business plan, uh, then you also get a support for four months without having to look for a job. Brilliant. Yeah. Very proactive. Um, yeah. And I, it did feel weird to ask for unemployment, but I was like, I have always worked so hard. Like I deserve it. Like I've paid the money. Um, it did feel weird to ask for it, but you know, it was mine. It's like, it's what it's for when you lose your job. 
but I felt a little bit guilty because like, I don't really want a job. <laughs> but I told them very quickly, like I was in a second meeting, like you have to go there once a month and show your face. Uh, and I said, I think, I think, you know, he already told me it's going to be very hard for you to find a job with your, all your different degrees and 10 year CEO, you are unemployable. And I'm like, well, I want to start a business anyway. I said, okay, let's put you on that track. So there was no discussion. It was not like no hiding of what uh, my goals That's were. Cool. Yeah. And that was great. That got me started. And then I had to, uh, basically create an LLC right afterwards. Uh, and I did. And then I was like, okay, where are my clients? <laughs> I didn't have a business idea, which is so not me because I used to be a business consultant as well and help people write business plans. So I was like, I could probably put a business plan together in a weekend, but I didn't do it for myself, which is, yeah, you can't help yourself. We always can help others better than ourselves. And, uh, I had a, a friend that offered me a consulting contract. It was like a traditional business consulting. And it, I think it was just what I needed to realize that I did not want to do that. Mm -hmm. I was sitting again, writing somebody else's business plan, creating pretty slides for them, for them to get funding or more clients. And I'm like, no way I'm going to do that. And I was then, you know, following a lot of people online yours, you are included. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, there must be another way. I'm seeing all these people having their online business. And um, yeah, so finally, January, February, um, 2014, I figured it out. Oh, I can actually be a business coach. I know how to set up a business. I know how to kind of motivate people. I was a Dale Carnegie trainer. I know how to help them through their mindset blocks. Wow. Why am I not doing that? Um, so yeah, it just took me a little bit of time to get there it's like in the book alchemist <laughs> yeah but i really like that because there's you know the 10-year overnight success story which a lot of very successful entrepreneurs talk about they're very clear about saying this was you know 10 years in the making and if you think about your date with destiny sorry unleash the power within it was 10 yeah. years ago last year when you made your first million in business but you wrote that down 10 years before and awesome that you got there but i just really wanted to highlight that to people that good things take time and it's usually a, a combination of all the multiple steps and everything that you show up and do consistently every day that is actually gets you to where you want to be. Yeah, very true. It took me very long time to kind of realize that this is what I'm doing. So yeah, from 2008 to March, 2014, I'd had this dream of entrepreneurship and maybe I had it earlier before, but it was getting clearer and clearer. And then in March, 2014, I made my first sale, one hour business coaching for $180. And that clicked something in me. I'm like, this is going to work. I, I started truly believing it. I didn't know exactly how I should make the next sale or whatever, because this seemed to be random. Uh, you know, I did not funnels or launch this or anything like that. But people were super happy with the advice I was giving, which was a general business advice. It was not just online business. Um, and, uh, it took me about, I was resisting having a coach. And I want to say to people who are maybe in similar footsteps, oh, I, I wish I would have hired someone earlier. Or, you know, I didn't even know what a mastermind was back then. Uh, so I wasn't a part of any program or, uh, or uh, I didn't have a coach. And I was kind of like going a, a little bit backwards. And I think I was in September. Then I'd done weekly webinars for a while. So I knew, how to, I knew I had to build my list. I knew that. I knew freebies and stuff like that. But I was like, I'm not selling. Why am I not selling? <laughs> because I wasn't making an offer. Uh, but it was kind of <laughs> obvious in hindsight. Uh, but I was like, really? And I was like, but you know, I've been a CEO. Like there was always these voices, like I should be better at this. Uh, but I just bit the bullet and hired the business coach. I had just transferred the money. I got the client the next day. I hadn't even spoken to her. And then wow. I knew what to do. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes just the investment, the act of investing in yourself to take on a guide, a mentor, advice, and say, look, I don't have to do this all by myself. And I'm willing to seek guidance, even though this is what I do for a living and have done very well. That is often the instigator for so many things unleashing and, and unlocking themselves for you. Yeah. 
And this was like a fast track business coaching. Like she just was basically teaching me how to make an offer. I'm like, I get it. I get it. So six weeks I worked together with her, uh, created a launch, made 27,000, oops, makes, made 55,000 in three months from really mm -hmm. kind of barely making anything <laughs> for the rest of the year. And, and for the next whole, for, an, for a, yeah, until 2016, I didn't hire anyone else. I was just using, it was a mindset block. It was not that C taught me this massive magic. It was also like I was open to see, oh, these people are doing that. Uh -uh, I get it. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to have my packages like that. And, da -da -da. and I just, I was fully booked because mm -hmm. I was very active on social media already. I was already doing the visibility. Mm -hmm. I was already building my list. It was just that last, uh, you know, making an offer, not being scared to follow through on your offer, realizing that you maybe have to send 15 emails. Um, and it's like very scary thought. And um, yeah, and then I just, it, it, something clicked. And then I, then I was like, okay, I'm not going to be doing this forever, like one-on-one -on -one coaching. I need to scale. I want to think big. Uh, because one of the things I was always looking for before I started business coaching was a business idea that was scalable. Because I, my parents had a dry cleaning when I was 10 years old. They had it for 30 years. Oh, okay. And every time we got more clothes in, we needed to hire more people to execute the tasks. Uh, I ran a software company for five years. I couldn't take on one contracts if I wouldn't hire more programmers. Mm -hmm. At some point, we ran out of programmers because the banks were doing so well. We know that it didn't end well, but uh, the banks were doing so well. They were stealing my programmers. There was 1% unemployment rate. Wow. And I said to the owner of the company, I didn't own it. Uh, I told him, sell now, sell now before there's a downturn. So I knew all these experiences had accumulated in my head. I'm like, I'm not going to have a business where it's based on how many people I employ. Mm -hmm. So doing one-on-one -on -one coaching, I knew that was... Uh, it was kind of something I didn't want to do in the beginning. I was like, can I not go straight to online courses? But I'm so glad that I made the mistake trying to sell online courses and it didn't really work out. And then I did one-on-one -on -one coaching. And then afterwards, when I started to sell online courses, that really worked because then I had done so much work one-on-one -on -one that I knew, knew my clients so well. Mm -hmm. Now I can teach that. But I had to make the mistake myself. Yeah, and I love that that story and I think it's a really really brilliant one for people to tune into because that's exactly why I started out with one-on-one -on -one coaching too. I knew that eventually I'd want to be doing something that was scalable that could reach more people where I could share my gifts with a lot more people than just one person at a time even though I love those people but it wasn't until hearing from them and working through with them in each session that I really understood where they were at and what the challenges were and how I could better help them and had I not had that intensive period for over a year actually, I wouldn't have been able to understand what they needed on a mass scale really that was still individual. So I'm really glad that you went through that as well. What do you yeah. think was the, the mindset? You said you had that mindset block, um, even though you knew you had all the tools and you knew how to be a great coach and you'd been doing it for years and you had all this experience, all these degrees. How did you move past that block? I know you hired a coach, but was there anything else that you did or that, that happened that you can actually think back to? Uh, the difference was, it was my name on mm. the line. Yeah. Interesting. I've been a CEO and the companies all had a name, like, mm -hmm. you know, some names and I was a CEO and I didn't own the company. I still was a very, you know, I ran the companies like I owned them. So, you know, I was always making sure when I was working through a turnaround, for instance, I would pay everyone else salary and I had to wait a few days maybe because we had cash flow issues in a turnaround situation and then I fixed that and we became very profitable. Um, but I would always put myself last mm. in the businesses. Um, but I found it very easy to sell because I had to pay all these people's salary. So I felt responsible, like I got to sell more contracts. And I wanted also to look good to the owners, to the board. And I said, 20% growth or 20% EBITDA, 40% growth, like all these numbers. This was like, 14 years ago, I was really in this world of like, we got to have profit in order to make the company more valuable. And when it came to me making an offer to an audience that felt more like, maybe not friends, they were people on my list and I didn't know them personally, but it felt like 
it was closer. Mm. And if I do anything wrong, or what will they think about me? Or I, it's my name. Yeah. I think that was the biggest block. Yeah. And so how did you move past that? Because I think I even experienced that in the last couple of years when I transitioned from the suitcase entrepreneur, which had been my identity for close to sort of seven or eight years into just being me. And there is a lot when you are behind your name, there is so much to consider and think about. You just touched on some of those points. You don't want to let people down. Everything you do, you view as a personal sort of a front on you. So if you do it well, makes you look great. If you don't feel you do it well, it feels like a real sort of personal attack or that you have failed somehow. Um, and, and that is a lot to grapple with. It is not for every person to be able to stand behind their name and stand up there. So I admire every single person who does. But what have been some of the key things that you've done to sort of like remove yourself from taking it all so personally? Is it that you focus so much on, the, you know, you have a very strong, clear vision of where you want to go, who you want to help, um, even from a charitable side, which is really, really fantastic. And we can talk about that. But how have you, yeah, I guess in some ways kind of just focused on the work that you want to do and the people that you want to impact? Has that been one of the ways that you've shifted? Well, I think the first was to realize that you are, you're actually being a disservice if you don't make your offer. So you are in a position to help and there are people in front of you that want your help but you're not offering it. So I'm like, well, that makes it kind of okay. So I have to make my offer. Otherwise I'm a bad person. So that was <laughs> kind of, that was helpful to think that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, learning a little bit the, those tactics in terms of like, okay, I need to make an offer. Uh, I, I need to figure out what people want, ask questions. I tried to sell an online course without asking people any questions. <laughs> that was so funny. You know, asking questions, uh, seeding. Uh, I am a master seeder. Like once I knew that, I was like, woo, I can be seeding all the time. Um, and uh, so it, it kind of does that process. It just took some clicks. I'm like, okay. So I do think there's something you need to learn. Uh, selling doesn't come naturally to everyone. I don't think it came naturally to me. Um, I was always selling as a CEO, but I was selling solutions like web, mm-hmm. websites and, and, and the customers came to us. So I was in the meeting. Okay, you came to me. Now I'm going to show you what you have. Okay, you want to buy it? And most people bought. I was like, that's easy. Uh, So online business is different. Mm -hmm. We have to uh, make people like us or, well, we shouldn't make them like us. Uh, Rather, like they have to find out we exist. And then we need to uh, give them content. So it's, it's very different from traditional business in that sense that you have to make people more interested and they may not be looking for your offer, not actively. Mm -hmm. And then you put an offer in front of them and they're like, oh, actually, that's kind of what I need right now. Well, it's because you asked them all those questions up front and figured out what they needed, but they didn't know yet that that was an offer. And then you make that offer and then you feel like, now I have to follow through. So it is easy to just send out one email and say, oh, nobody bought them. Um, Typically, nobody buys. Uh, you have to send multiple emails and knowing that you, people have to see it 10, 20, 30 times until they buy. Um, I guess logic did help a little bit there. And then that shift, when you see it working, I'm like, okay, I'll repeat what, so rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Yeah. I'm so glad you said about the 20 to 30 emails, because I think for people listening, any aspect of your business, it is actually about persevering and staying the course and doing much more than you think you actually have to to convince or I like the word enroll people into buying from you Um, because especially in this day and age where we're so inundated with media and content and offers and marketing everywhere people are a lot more shrewd they're a lot more wise especially in the online courses space I mean there's such a proliferation of people producing courses now people have become a lot more I think they've just wisened up about it and they're very clear and specific about who they buy from, whether they trust that person, that person's likable, credible, visible, as you said, um, they walk their talk and people are just, yeah, much savvier. And so it's actually harder to enroll more people unless you're really doing all the right things. And 
part of that, as you mentioned, when you were back on lynda.com, a great learning site, is learning and upskilling all the time. I was just yeah. having a chat to a friend this morning and we're both excited to learn more about YouTube and YouTube marketing because you can rest on your laurels when you get to a certain point of success and you forget to stop, I guess, learning and becoming a student yourself. So if you're wanting people to enroll as a student in your course, you have to be a student of life and improvement all the time, right? Very right. Yeah. It has helped me though to take a break from learning. I think mm -hmm. typically in your first year business or even oh, before yeah. you start your business, uh, it's, it's, it's like this addiction of having to have all the courses that everyone is talking about and signing up for every free challenge or a free oh. webinar or free workshop and then being very selective mm -hmm. uh, and even, even stopping for a while um, and then going back to it. Yeah, so I agree you have to continuously educate yourself, but I think there might be a period sometimes where I say, okay, now I just need to implement what I learned. And so mm -hmm. yeah, in 2016, I, 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 I found a mastermind, business coach slash mastermind, and, and I've been in a mastermind since then, and that has been really helpful. Like, it's not that I, I'm not a person that asks a lot of questions and need much help, like, but I can watch. And mm -hmm. if I'm in a small group, I learn a lot. It's almost like osmosis. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you saying that and I love that for masterminds the same because I often feel I have more answers for people than I need answers for, but it is through modeling and watching people and also sometimes just listening to what they actually say versus what they're doing. That's so fascinating. Right. I also yeah. agree on the learning front. Like I probably took a good, in that first year of business, I learned everything I could. And then I started implementing, learn, implement, learn, implement. And then the more the reason I was saying that is I think you get to a point where you think you kind of know everything or you feel like you've got great success. And so you're actually just constantly helping others. And that's the dangerous point on the inflection point, I guess, at which you need to make sure you are still upskilling and staying ahead of the curve um, and looking to the future and what's coming, because that's where it can creep up and bite your butt way more quickly than you realize. And I think that happened for me last year. I was like, wait a minute, I used to be really good at all this stuff. And now there are people who are just doing it way better because they're just at the start of their journey and they're learning like crazy. And now I want to focus on upskilling again. So yeah, I agree. There's times for learning, there's times for implementing. Yeah, very right. No, I've had this discussion that you mentioned about, I guess there's like this learning and then implementing and then you are scaling and, and growing and you come to that point where, well, you know, you're one of the more known persons in your field maybe or in your niche and you might get complacent. I think this can happen in sport, in business, mm -hmm. anything. Uh, pop stars, yeah. they become complacent and, and, and stop reinventing themselves. And I think uh, that's exactly right. You need to constantly, not that you constantly kind of, oh, I have to learn all the tools. I think it's not about that, but being aware that we all need to grow. Mm. So with that in mind, and given your incredible success, so in the past four years, you've gone from that, that first launch, 27,000, I think it was, through to seven-figure business in four years, which is really, to other people, seems very quick, and it is. But you've had a very clear plan. Um, you recently sent out an email series charting exactly how much you made in each year. And I just thought that was fascinating because I was like, clearly you're the numbers person here. You've kept an account of that. You know exactly what happened, your list growth, your... Um, revenue, the clients you took on. And throughout all of that, what has been the, I guess, the mindset that you've taken or any wonderful keys or tips that you can give to people who are pushing for that, but coming up against themselves or blocks, because that is a fascinating journey and you've had a very clear vision for it. So what's the sort of secret Sigrun source that we can tap into um, that's allowed you to do that? I knew I wanted to scale and scale uh, is for bigger impact. So money is nice, but uh, even though it sounds like I might be driven by money because I mention my revenue a lot, but it's, I mention it as an inspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, achieving the seven figures la a year ago uh, for the first time uh, and then increasing it by 50% last year, um, mm -hmm. What achieving it, achieving, <laughs> uh, yeah, achieving the million dollars, that was a symbolic milestone. You know, you, you don't really see the money. I had mm -hmm. to lock into my system the January 1st, 2018 and check, oh, is it really a million? Like the number, because you don't see the money. That's the thing. It just goes in and out. And you, I reinvest most into my business. So, um, because when you want to scale, 
you don't take the money out. And that's where I can have a heated debate with uh, other people out there who are maybe have different values in life. Mm -hmm. I have a bigger mission and that means I, I am going for growth, fast growth. Yeah. And um, I knew one, one, I have to go to groups and from groups I needed a signature program. I knew the Ascension model. I had been watching others. So it's, yeah, like again, like osmosis. So I, it was not that I wrote it down and said, okay, by this time I have to have this. I just knew you have to have a signature program and then you can have a group coaching program and then you can have a mastermind. So I knew the Ascension model. It was just that uh, I started with masterminds. I went from one-on-one -on -one to masterminds basically. With my business experience, I went straight to the top and uh, I help people basically without a curriculum. I had a massive library of resources, my hundred over hundred webinars. So there was massive content, but I didn't have a course. I had a small course, how to find your passion and the right business idea, but I didn't have like a, a program, a business program. And I was a little bit frustrated, I must say. Mm. Uh, now looking back, it all worked out beautifully. Um, but I remember, like you said, I was 2014 and 15 and even 16 watching people who just started, you know, who were 10, 15 years younger, already had their signature program, were making a million dollars. And I'm like, what am I doing? Why am I so slow? But I get it now. Like everybody takes their time and I needed that path, but I knew I needed an Ascension model. Ascension model basically means that all doors lead to one program. And from that program, people grow into your other programs and becomes a lot easier to scale and have a bigger impact. Um, so I, I knew I wanted to go on that path. And there were times where I truly was frustrated about what's my program? Like, I really didn't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, I had all these webinars and I didn't see the program yet. Um, and I had to, 2016, I really just put it away. I said, it will come. Like, I, I can't force it. Yeah. And it came a year later. January 2017, I just did a webinar. and said, hey, you can join this new program. And I had created zero content and people knew it. And they were a part of an inaugural class. And I took, my, I took two years to create the content. Wow. You know, I know, I know some people would just probably have, push this together in, in two, three months, but I really took my time mm. uh, to create the content. Uh, not that the content is like huge, but just like I took my time to create each module. And um, uh, so the first people stayed in for two years yeah, <laughs> until all the, all the content was created. And, and it turned out people need more access to me to ask their questions and they need the community and then they need the content. There was a part of me even like, why am I creating this content? <laughs> because people just want their questions answered and they want to feel supported and they want to be inspired because there's always somebody taking action and there's a success story. Mm -hmm. And then others kind of wake up and say, oh, I can do that too. And you need several role models. I realized that I am not a role model necessary. Well, let's say that you, I could be like a faraway role model for uh, my audience today, but they need internally like within the community, they need their smaller role models. They need someone who just, it's you know, accessible is, and relatable and close yeah, to and, one yeah. step ahead, one step yeah. ahead. Yeah. I often say like, you know, Oprah can be a role model, but at the same time, I don't believe like, well, not that I don't believe that I can be Oprah. I can never be her. I was only be me. Yeah, the Icelandic but, Oprah. <laughs> Iceland, yeah. But it feels very, very far away. Like, and I don't want to, I don't want to do a TV show or do three episodes a day and every, anyway, so it feels like very far away. And I think that's what we have to also be cautious about when we grow that, uh, um, it almost feels like I'm, I'm driving thousand kilometers an hour and maybe my audience is doing hundred and that's fine. And I need to highlight then stars within my community that, you know, are going at the same speed as them. I'm just laughing at how fast that car is. <laughs> I think it's actually a flying jet. Um, and so I love that. So Somba, Sigrun's online MBA was born. I also love that your name is in it. Like, I just think that's ballsy and awesome and just how many people have got to know you by name. And I also love the story. Really, if you think back to it, you took that MBA way back in London and you already yeah. saw holes and flaws in it. And then you've gone and created your own 
online MBA yeah. that's way more practical, that's up to date, that's almost disruptive in terms of you know a lot of the teachings that you put into it, the quality behind it, and it's getting probably far better results for all your clients and amazing ladies than that MBA did for all those people in London. And how much was that MBA in London? That was uh, 40 or 50,000 pounds. Wow. And this is the other thing that blows my mind is traditional yeah. educations that typically leave you in debt and don't necessarily guarantee you success versus the plethora of amazing online courses and content that's out there. Some free, but you know, you pay for the quality and you pay to get the results these days at a fraction of the investment of what you had to make back then. Yeah. That's nuts. Just yeah. Nuts. That is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Very and there's no implementation really. You're just like uh, being fitted material mm -hmm. um, that outdates as soon as you close the door, or as soon as you get your degree, it's outdated. Mm -hmm. um, I would say what I benefit from is expanding my horizon, uh, getting to know people from different countries. It helped them a lot, especially when you come from a small country like Iceland and doing your MBA in London. Uh, international community. Um, so I benefit from the network immensely, but I do think the men mm. benefit more than women, mm. Interesting which is another reason. Yeah. Another reason for me to have created, to focus on women more. We do have a few men in Samba, but mainly women. Mm -hmm. And I think this experience of uh, now 10 years later, uh, there are many men that meet up, help each other get a job. The women are somehow not a part of that club even if we spend two years together in a classroom. Mm, interesting. Yeah. I think it's because women are often people helping others. Like we have this amazing talent and ability to collaborate, to bring teams together. And um, there's been a lot of research done around women CEOs or women um, in organizations who are incredible at um, the bringing of the teams together and expanding people's horizons. And so I think we ask for less help because we're busy helping others. Um, whereas, the, you know, often the guys that I've seen from research, they're just happy to lend a hand because they're helping each other up, but on a more individual basis, almost it's like a camaraderie. Whereas women are yeah. helping everybody and it's kind of like putting themselves, not necessarily always first, as you said, that you did for a long time as a CEO. Mm. Um, and there's benefit, you know, there's benefits to both. That's what I love about the world. Um, but I know that you are, all for gender equality, equality in, in general. And I'd love for you to share, if you're willing, your big grand vision of what you want to achieve. Because this is all about a much higher purpose for you. This is, this, is, this is your big juicy, I guess, vision in my mind. Are you willing to share? Sure. Yeah. Um, I realized probably a year into my business or maybe in my second year that I was chasing my why, my dream, my purpose on a bigger scale. I, I recall being 16 years old, doing a course with a dressmaker where I was learning how to do my own patterns. Um, I had been suing since I was 12 years old and now I was kind of, uh, you know, going on the higher education, so to speak yeah. there. Uh, and we were at home of a, uh, a women dressmaker and we were probably eight people and uh, eight women. I was 16, everybody else was in their 40s. And so I didn't say much. I was very quiet, just listened. And uh, they were talking about their dreams. And none of them had realized their dreams. And I was like, really? You know, in my head, I was thinking, why? And then they discussed that further. And this went and on for weeks. Um, they got married. They had kids. This and this and that. All these reasons that are very acceptable, especially back then. I call them excuses. Um, because, you know, living in a country where we're supposed to be number one in gender equality, why should a woman not follow their dreams versus a man? This is what I saw as a 16-year-old. Mm. I was looking at the world and saying, why do women feel that they can follow their dreams, but at the same time, I'm seeing men chasing their dreams? So something is off in the world. Mm -hmm. And I didn't just look at Iceland. I was just thinking, the world is unfair. So women can't do what I want to do. And I made a decision, very dramatic one, not to have children. Uh, and I do not have children today. I have two stepsons though, since uh, 10 years uh, with my husband. Um, and I made another decision. I was never going to have a man stop me. And I decided to study abroad. And when my boyfriend at that time, when I was 20 years old, didn't want to come with me, I said, okay, and I'm going alone. And I think I wouldn't have made that choice 
if I hadn't, you know, decided that 16 years old, I made like really bold decisions. I became a feminist. Uh, I was wearing a red coat <laughs> that I made myself. Um, so all this fast forward to today, um, I knew that I didn't want to be a politician. I think politician for me, um, I feel somehow, somehow they're ineffective and uh, it, it's slow and uh, this whole political, like, you know, knife in the back and all that stuff, corruption. I think there's a lot of corruption in politics. I know there's a lot of good people too, but we hear about the corruption. Um, and I was like, I no. So many people who go into politics with the right dream and vision, even like Obama, they get stifled and stymied by the parties and the political agendas yeah. and they don't get to do the work that they really wanted to do. I agree. So I, yeah, I don't know. I saw this even at 16 year old that I didn't want to go this path and I didn't know what the solution was. So I just let life be. Um, but yeah, once I, once I achieved the million dollars, there was a click, like it was a symbolic number. It was not really about the money. It was like, I can achieve this. Then I can allow myself to dream bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, my mission has gotten clearer. Uh, I would, I would phrase it in all kinds of different ways in the past years. It was always similar. It was always around gender equality um, or helping women make their dreams come true. But now I have like the tightened up uh, mission statement, accelerate gender equality through female entrepreneurship. Really short. Love it. And that's my mission statement. Now, what I'm doing today uh, with uh, Samba, you know, mostly a female community. I have a group coaching program, a mastermind. To me, these are uh, ways to help women make their dreams come true, which I think is through female entrepreneurship. But I thought to myself, like, okay, that's on one hand a business, but I have to make a bigger impact in some way. Uh, and I've been thinking about writing a book. Uh, the idea of writing about gender equality and female entrepreneurship, I actually have had it since January 2016. Mm -hmm. So it just, you know, good ideas take time too. But then... Uh, this idea came back to me that I needed to do a conference. Uh, I've done three events for my community. Uh, the first one was 90 people. Second one, 90 people. It was the same place. They didn't uh, have space for more than 90. The last one was 200 uh, women in Zurich, Switzerland. And I was like, okay, I can do 200. How about bigger? Well, it could be 500, but no. Uh, in Iceland, is a conference center at the harbor. So just envision Sydney Opera House, but Reykjavik, Iceland, and a bit a modernized building. So it's a glass building. Mm -hmm. And the biggest room in that building hosts 1,600 people. But that's not the key. The, the room is fiercely red. They call it fiercely red. It's a special color combination. And just this idea that the room is called Fiercely Red, I was like, that's my room. They built it for me. Uh, <laughs> and I've seen the photos on Facebook. It looked amazing. And it looks amazing. <laughs> so this scary idea came to me that I should do an event there. But then I thought like, yeah, 2022, 2000, like once I'm ready. But we know it's not once you're ready. It's once you decide to do it, you're going to get ready. So October, I took the bold decision. I emailed them, you know, uh, about booking. And I've booked 18th and 19th of June, 2020. Uh, 19th of June will be the day where uh, it's been 105 years since women got voting rights in Iceland. Wow. So it's also a special day and it will be easier for me to get Icelandic speaker. We do have a female prime minister right, right now and I have no doubt because of our small society, that if she's still a prime minister in 2020, that I would be able to get her to speak. Of course you would, because you're saying. Of good. course I will. I think I, you I, just pointed to the most wonderful point there, which is once you decide, you set everything in motion to make that a reality, to make your dream come true. Once you have that absolute clarity of vision, which you do, and it has to be clear, and it has to be with real intent, and it has to have a higher purpose, you can achieve anything you want. So that was the bit, that was the juice bit that I was trying to get to that I think you do extremely well. Um, yeah, sorry, I feel I interrupted, but I just, that's the bit, that's the untapping right there. That I've made the decision. Yeah. 
universe make it happen for me universe provides i think you need to know what you want and then need to take action on it and it has helped me in the past this is uh, you know to take some bold decision and then just figure it out like jumping into the deep end and i'll run to swim uh and i have been discussing this and everybody's like wow that's a great idea and uh, people have come up to me and said i'm happy to help you fill that room and i'm like great because i have no idea how i'm gonna do that <laughs> And that's also what I love. You don't always have to have all the answers, right? And I think that's something you do very well. And I've seen other successful people do is one, they make the decision Two, they book something in. So it becomes real. And then as Marie Folio says, everything's figure out, figurable, outable. And I think it's the not knowing sometimes that gives us the most advantage because when you know every single step, it can feel quite debilitating. Whereas I think some of the best ideas that have been actioned have come through not knowing that it's going to be a really hard slog to get to here, but because you made that intention to get there, you're going to do it no matter what. And it's the not knowing that gives you the opportunity to try things and experiment. And some of those things will come off and some won't. If you don't know, you never will actually make it happen. No. Well, it's like worst case scenario, I'll sit alone in the room and I'll join my fiercely red room, but I know it will not happen. Like yeah. already that idea, that would be the worst case scenario. Like I've already kind of imagined putting the budget aside and just paying for the room. I already know I can pay for it. That's mm-hmm. not the thing, but th- that, that wouldn't be the dream. It's mm-hmm. having the room full of people standing on stage with all these amazing speakers that are going to come there. Uh, and uh, yeah, I just know it's going to be amazing. Yeah. And as you said, because you put that vision out there, people buy into visions and they want to make it come true as well. They want to be a part of it. So I have absolutely no doubt and I'm really excited to be there. I've been longing for an excuse to come to Iceland. So this is going to be it. I'm going to put it in my calendar and make it happen. Um, thank you so much, Sigrun, for just sharing your story today, um, revealing so much about the journey, the roller coaster ride, and just all the decisions that you have made along the way that have allowed you to now be this extremely strong feminist with a massive mission. Hopefully, people are going to support you. I'll put all the links below um, and in the show notes. Is there any final words that you want to impart um, for people who are listening to help them and make sure that they follow their dreams? Uh, I was just uh, coming back to a talk I did um, a couple of years ago in Ottawa, Canada, and I was allowed to talk like for 10 minutes. I was like, 10 minutes, that's very short. So, uh, but uh, I I shared this taking a leap of faith. Uh, This has got nothing to do with faith, but just like the saying, and I came up, I have it right in front of me here. I took a leap of faith. The best thing would be it would work out. The worst thing would, I, at least I knew I had tried. Beautiful. Love it. Absolutely. So true. Oh, that's a good one to leave on. Thank you so much for being my first Untapped podcast guest uh, of the year. Really, really thrilled. As I said, I'll be linking to Sigrin and all her awesomeness below. Um, but thank you so much. Thank Thanks you for having me. I really hope you enjoyed this interview with Sigrin. I find her fascinating and I personally have really enjoyed getting to know her and looking forward to meeting her in Iceland in 2020 and maybe you will too. If you want to find out about her offerings, please head to nataliesisson.com forward slash Sigrin. That's S-I-G. R-U-N. I will keep that link up to date with both her free profit workshop and then also more details about Somba, Sigrun's online MBA. Also, you can find full show notes at nataliesisson.com forward slash zero zero three. All right, it's time to go and untap your potential.